Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. The day that I found out that there were giant creatures known as Bigfoot. My encounter happened in 1974. I was 21 years old. For 48 years, I've kept this encounter to myself, and I'm still dealing with the PTSD. This is my encounter. I needed some downtime away from my oil field job, so I planned a vacation to Beaver's Bend State Park in southeast Oklahoma during the first week of March in 1974. My pregnant wife, six months pregnant, and I had planned to tent camp on the Mountain Fork River below the dam on Broken Bow Lake for four days. I rented the farthest south tent site, which was only about 40 yards from a cement dam on the river. This made the upper portion of the river deeper for swimming, better kayaking, and fishing. We had just beautiful weather, with lows in the low to mid-50s and highs of the 65 to 70 degrees. The first two days were simply terrific. We had fresh fish for breakfast and dinner both days. Now, on the morning of the third day, I got up at 5 a.m., made a pot of coffee, I had two cups, and then I grabbed my tackle box, rod and reel, and a five-gallon bucket to put my catch in. I then walked down to the cement dam where I had fished the previous two days. This morning, there was about an eight-mile-per-hour breeze blowing in my face from the southeast. The sun was just starting to rise when I made my first cast using an inline single spinner one-ounce lure white with black dots, and a white horsehair skirt over a barbless treble hook. After fishing for about 25 minutes, I had a three-pound smallmouth bass and two rainbow trout of about two pounds each. I had planned on catching one more fish and then call it quit. As I made my next cast, the lure hung up behind me on what I thought was a tree limb. So, I turned, looking up to see where my lure had caught the limb, but all I could see was a wall of cinnamon brown hair about five feet from me. My lure had hung up in the upper left chest of something that I didn't know existed. My head was about four to five inches below its belly button, and I'm six feet tall. It was all of eleven feet tall, five foot wide across the shoulders, and somewhere between 1,200 to 1,300 pounds. Its biceps were as big as my 36-inch waist. My eyes moved up to its face. It had a conical-shaped head. The eyes were as big as a Coke can and red. It was looking down at me and snarling. Its teeth were twice as big as a horse's teeth and it had only slightly pronounced eyes. His head looked to be the size of a five-gallon bucket. He had a protruding brow ridge, a hooded nose, and his skin was a very dark, leathery brown, and he had a slightly wrinkled face. I could not move. I could hear and feel very low growl that seemed to rattle my bones with a pressure all over my body that I can't explain. At this moment, I truly believed that my life was over. I couldn't speak or holler, but I remember thinking, Oh my God, I'm so sorry for hurting you. Then, like turning off a light switch, everything went black. I passed out. I believe that was at about 6.30 a.m. When I woke up, my watch read 7 a.m. I felt like I had been drained of all my energy and I had a terrible headache. I sat up, shaking uncontrollably and sweating heavily as I looked around, and I saw 
that my tackle box had been smashed flat. My rod was broken into four pieces, and the three fish that I had caught were taken out of the five-gallon bucket. After regaining some of my composure, I saw two footprints where that thing had been standing. I had a measuring tape, so I measured both prints. They were 22 and a half inches long, 10 inches across at the ball of the foot, and 7 inches across at the heel. I had never seen footprints so huge. I was still shaking uncontrollably, and I had to just get the heck away from there. So, I picked up all of my crushed and broken fishing equipment and carried it to a trash bin where I disposed of it. I walked back to camp sat down, poured myself another cup of coffee, and waited for my wife to get up. As she exited the tent, I poured her a cup of coffee, and she asked, how was the fishing this morning? I explained to her that during the night, someone had come into camp and had stolen all of my fishing gear. Man, was she mad, but that was a lot better than me trying to explain to her what I had actually seen and what had transpired down at the river. At this point, I was still feeling so very lucky to be breathing and alive. I had one more cup of coffee, and then I told my wife that I wasn't feeling quite up to par, and that I was just ready to go home. You know, I can't help but believe that that darn creature had been watching me catch fish, and just wanted my darn fish. To this day, I still can't believe how that SOB snuck up behind me without my knowing it. Since that day, I've given away my fishing gear, and only within the last couple of years, I had an interest in finding out more about what it is that took my love of the outdoors. You know, back then, I didn't know about PTSD, but I'm pretty sure that's what I was experiencing. Then came the night terrors. At least once, and sometimes twice a night, my screaming, kicking, and punching would wake everyone and everything in the house. That creature would be creeping up on me from behind while in a spider crawl position, and then I would turn and see him. At that point, he would bounce to his feet, grab me by the shoulders, and pick me up to where we were looking eye to eye. He was snarling, and then he started to open that huge mouth. At this point, I would be awake and covered in sweat and hyperventilating. I had these night terrors every night, or every other night for about a year. After that, they became more sporadic for the next 47 years. Now it seems to only happen about once a month, thank God. On to the next one. I have a very large family. So large, in fact, that if we go anywhere, we usually take up the whole area and have the place to ourselves. What I mean about that is if we went out to dinner at a restaurant, we would take all the seating in the whole place. We are also a very close-knit family. The fam, as we call ourselves, consists of aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters, cousins, etc., etc. Not just immediate family members. I promise this will make more sense later in the story. We are so close that we all live blocks away from each other. We see each other daily and our get-togethers are every other Saturday. But one family member I was very close to was my Uncle Bill. When planning a family get-together, Uncle Bill would suggest that we all go to a park or to a campground so we could relax, go fishing, bike riding, and just have fun, instead of having to make reservations to accommodate the large number of members that attended. I thought that was a great idea, because for a 14-year-old, I really did not like getting all dressed up to go to a fancy restaurant wait for all of us to be seated, then wait some more to order our food, then wait more for the food to be delivered, and so forth. I thought it was a waste of our wait time 
when we could be out in the great outdoors doing fun things like fishing, hiking, or just relaxing while waiting on dinner to be served. But most of the family enjoyed all the wait time and wanted to go into the city for our gatherings. My uncle Bill and I were outnumbered when it came to voting on going to a park or camping for our gathering versus making reservations at a fancy restaurant every time. That is until one weekend. We were not outnumbered and most of the family voted to side with uncle and I. I was still in a somewhat shocked state when I came home from school on a Friday afternoon and my mother asked me to help her pack our camping supplies in the trunk of the car for a weekend getaway with the fam. I was so happy that my Uncle Bill's persistence had paid off, and we were finally going camping instead of a dreaded restaurant scene. I happily joined my mother and sister in gathering the tents, sleeping bags, blankets, and totes filled to the brim with cooking supplies and food. I had no idea where we were going camping at, but my mind was filled of all the fun activities that I imagined we would be doing. I wanted to take my fishing rod, bike, hiking shoes, swimsuit, and anything else that I thought I may need on this trip. But to my dismay, I knew that I could not bring most because we had no room in the car to put them. But that did not stop me from trying. With the last tote of cooking supplies carried out to the car, I looked down at the street to my Uncle Bill's house and noticed he had hooked up his bath boat behind his truck. That is when it fully hit me. I was ecstatic. We were really going camping and I knew we were going to have the best weekend ever. I also realized there was enough room in the boat to put my fishing supplies. I was beyond excited. I squeezed the last tote of food supplies into the trunk and took off running down to my uncle's house. When I reached the driveway to his house, I stopped running and noticed that Uncle Bill was coming out of the front door with a big smile on his face. He looked so happy and stress-free, not like the other times when he would come home from work as a manager of a manufacturing company. He looked so tired and stressed, but not this time. He looked like a whole new person. Heavily out of breath from running from my house to his, I asked if I could put my fishing equipment in the boat. He probably knew we had no room in the car, for my mother was his sister and he knew all too well that she would try to pack the whole house just for a weekend getaway. He let out a jolly laugh and told me that there was no need to bring my fishing gear. He had it all taken care of. I let out a sigh of relief and noticed that I had never seen Uncle Bill so happy and full of energy. His eyes sparkled while we planned our weekend of what we wanted to do. We knew that maybe the men in the fam would want to fish, but we knew that grandma, mother, sister, and the nieces would want to do other things. So Uncle Bill and I visioned what we would do when we arrived at our camping spot. That night, I stayed up late. I wanted to make sure I had everything I wanted to take all packed up. Even though this was just a weekend camping trip, it seemed to me like a long vacation. I could not remember the last time my family had taken a vacation, so I was sure to make the best out of this camping trip. When I finally laid down and fell asleep, I began to dream. A nightmare would be a better term. I guess the camping trip had leaked into my subconscious mind, for in my nightmare, we were already set up at a camp spot and enjoying the nature around us. We had just finished dinner and were relaxing by the campfire when suddenly a loud scream came from the woods that startled everyone, a scream I had never heard before. The next thing in my dream was I was running down a narrow path away from something huge that was chasing me. My heart was beating rapidly 
and I could hardly breathe. My legs felt like a ton of bricks as I tried to run faster. The thing that was chasing me looked like a half-man, half-bear, and it was gaining on me. As I turned around to see if I was outrunning it, I noticed that it was upon me and reaching out to grab my arm. Panicked, I tried to run faster, but I tripped over a log in the path and fell on my back. As I looked up, all I could see was a bright light in my eyes and a massive arm reaching out to grab me. Suddenly, I awoke and noticed that the bright light in my dream was the sunlight streaming through my bedroom window and into my eyes. I let out a long sigh as I rolled over to face the wall. Then I realized it was daylight and time to get up and get ready for the awesome weekend we had planned. As soon as we were all in the car and leaving the house, the dream or nightmare was all forgotten about, and the anticipated fun weekend had taken its place in my mind. While on our way to the campground, I never knew where we were going, and for some odd reason, I never asked. I just enjoyed the ride out of the city and into more sparsely populated area. The four-lane roads turned into two lanes, and trees replaced buildings on the sides of the narrow road. I noticed that it was taking a long time to get to our destination, and I began to get bored of riding in the cramped car. My little sister, 12 years old at the time, began annoying me with her want-to-play-a-game questions and constantly talking about unimportant things that only mattered to no one. She would only talk about things because, just like me, she was bored and ready to move out of the cramped back seat of the car we were in. Just when I thought I could not take any more of my sister's annoyance, the stuffy air that came from the car's vent, the cramped back seat, and the boredom that overwhelmed me, I asked the most famous question that children ask their parents. I leaned up and took a deep breath and asked, Are we there yet? in a somewhat desperate tone of voice. As soon as the words left my lips, I noticed the turn signal suddenly flicker on and we began to turn into a gravel road. I looked out my side window and saw a sign that read, Mountain Pass Campground, and I knew we had finally made it to our camp. I felt a rush of excitement as I reached for the door handle to open as soon as the car came to a stop but the gravel road was so long and curvy that I had loosened my grip on the door handle and turned around to see the rest of the family that had followed us. I counted six cars behind us, and Uncle Bill and Auntie Janet led the pack with the boat in tow. In all, eight vehicles on a small, dusty gravel road did not help the stuffy air in the back of our cramped car, but we were almost there. A lifetime later, it would seem, I stood where our tent later would be placed and took a deep breath of fresh air that filled my lungs. I could hardly wait to go exploring in the campground. As I looked around, though, I noticed there were no other campers in the small campground. Even though we were a big crowd, I surely thought that other humans would be around to enjoy the great outdoors and be camping also. I glanced around more and noticed that many, if not all of the camping spots, were overgrown with tall grass and weeds. It looked as though no one had occupied any of the spaces in a very long time. Even the gravel road had tall grass growing in the middle of it. My heart sank a little when I saw that the campground was not how I had pictured it, but when I saw the beautiful lake at the end of the road, my mind changed in an instant, and I knew we were going to have the best weekend ever. When all the trees were erected and the paths were clear to them, my cousin Tim and I met at the end of the gravel road where Uncle Bill had placed his boat by the lake. We were ready to go fishing. I wanted to go as soon as possible, for it was getting late in the evening and I knew that Uncle Bill would have us back on shore before nightfall. But we did not have to wait long 
for Uncle Bill was ready to go also. We all climbed into the boat, and Uncle started it up, and we headed toward the middle of the lake. It did not take long to be in the middle, and Uncle Bill killed the motor, and we came to a stop. We readied our fishing poles and began fishing. I do not know how long we were out there in the middle, but we never caught a fish, and we all were ready to move to another location. Uncle Bill started the motor and slowly moved toward the bank and out of sight of the campground. We thought that fishing in shallower waters may have been a better chance of catching a fish and maybe enough to grill over the campfire. We found our place and set up for fishing. Uncle Bill and Cousin Tim had cast their lines out before I could get mine baited. When I was ready to throw my line out, I moved to the front of the boat so that my line would be near the water's edge and close to the small trees that had fallen into the water. I had hoped that was where the fish may be hiding. I carefully aimed where I wanted my bait to land, and with a steady hand, reared back and flicked the line toward the fallen tree. I watched as it landed in the exact spot I'd wanted it to. I slowly began to reel in the line when suddenly something big hit the water right beside the boat and made a huge splash right beside me. The splash was so large, it soaked the right side of my pants. I quickly turned to see if anything had fallen off the boat, but nothing had. Nothing heavy could have possibly fallen off the boat. I turned to Uncle Bill as he asked me what had happened, and if I lost anything when again something hit the water near the boat and made another huge splash. This time, it was closer to the back of the boat where Uncle Bill was sitting. Startled, Uncle Bill yelled out, Hey, stop that! You're scaring the fish away! As he thought it may be someone in our family trying to scare us. When suddenly, another big splash occurred at about the same place as the last one. That is when I got a little spooked. I saw on my uncle's face a look of fright or concern. Without saying a word, he quickly reeled in his bait and started up the motor. He put it in high gear and raced toward camp. I barely had time to reel in my cast before we were ordered off the boat and go straight to our campsite. With the way he was acting, I left everything in the boat, jumped out, and ran to my campsite. Tim was right on my heels, and he followed me. When we arrived, we plopped down by the campfire and told my dad what had happened. Dad stood up and told us that he would go help Uncle Bill with the boat. I watched as he swiftly walked the small path we created to our campsite, turned right onto the gravel road, and headed toward the lake. As I turned back around to face the campfire, Mother came out of the tent with her hands full of food and motioned for me to come help her. She handed me a casserole dish, and Tim and I followed her out of our campsite and to the made-up community campground. We met the rest of the fam there as they prepared a feast for us all. Dad and Uncle Bill came in just in time as dinner was served. The sun was setting about the time we finished dinner, and about the time for the adults to sit around to socialize. The women would be in one group, and talking about what shows they watched during the weekdays and gossip about the other people from their church, the men would form another group and talk about random stuff like football, the latest tools and machinery. The younger children would be running around playing games and annoying their mothers. But Tim and I, the only teenagers in the family at that time, would suffer from boredom and have nothing interesting to do. That is, until Tim had an idea that I agreed to. Let's go explore the campground, he said with excitement in his voice. It was not completely dark, and I knew the campground was very small. I thought we could explore it and be back before the sun went down, even though it was dusk. I did not think much about how fast it gets dark at dusk. Okay, let's go, I replied. As I stood up and waited for him to tell his dad what we were doing, I noticed that his dad gave him something as Tim swiftly put it in his pocket. 
I did not think much about it as we headed down the path toward the gravel road. Instead of going toward the lake, we went the other direction from where we came in. I wanted to see how many campsites there were and if any other campers came in after us. As we walked the gravel road, the light from the sun faded fast. I looked up to the sky and noticed the stars were shining brightly and there were no clouds in the sky. The moon was on full display and looked beautiful in the cloudless sky. As we walked, and I assumed there were no other campers around, as a matter of thinking, I never saw a ranger station, gift shop, or any kind of small building when we came in to the campground. That got me thinking, if anyone ever visited this place, and how did our family make reservations or book the campsite here while my mind was in another place? Tim's mind must have been too. He silently walked beside me with his eyes to the ground. I nudged him gently as he came back to reality. We both laughed and stopped walking. We looked around and realized it was completely dark and we had walked much further than we wanted to. A little fear took hold in my mind as we both turned around to walk back to camp. We held the same speed of walking as we had when we were going away from camp and began small talk with each other. We were in deep conversation and enjoying our time out on the gravel road. The full moon and cloudless skies gave enough glow for us to see where we were going and to follow the road back to our family. We were talking about a girl that Tim had a crush on when suddenly we both stopped in our tracks and an overwhelming feeling of being watched took over us. I did not know what to think about it, for that was the first time I'd ever felt something like that. My heart began to race, and I felt edgy. I looked over at Tim and saw that he too had felt the same as I. His body shivered as he reached into his pants pocket and pulled out a small flashlight. He flicked it on and shined it all around us. As we were hoping, we did not see anything unusual. So, he turned the light off and we began to quickly walk back to the safety of our camp. But as soon as we turned a curve in the road, we once again stopped in our tracks. A feeling of helplessness washed over me. I was frozen in place and I held my breath as to hold on to it like it was my very last. I could feel Tim's whole body shivering next to me right in front of us, in the middle of the road, between us and the safety of our campsite, stood the largest creature I had ever seen. At first, I could only make out the shadow of the creature. The moon glow was the only light we had. I saw a small head, very large shoulders, the waist was slim, and very muscular legs, especially the calves. The only other thing that frightened me the most was how tall it seemed to be. As I stared at the beast in front of us, I heard a faint whimper come from Tim. I turned my gaze to him as he slowly pulled the flashlight out of his pocket, pointed it to the creature, and with shaking hands clicked the button, and the beam of light shone the creature's face. I had only about a second to get a glimpse of what it looked like, as soon as the light hit the creature's face, its large yellow eyes lit up and a deep growl bellowed out toward us. We both were frozen in fear when suddenly Tim let out a high-pitched scream, dropped the flashlight, and sprinted off the gravel road and into the woods, away from our camp. In a split second, the yellow-eyed large beast also ran into the woods in the same direction as Tim. I stood, frozen in place, as I could hear Tim's screams with each step he took. When I realized the monster must be giving chase to Tim, I snapped out of my panicked mode, picked up the flashlight, and ran toward camp, all the while screaming as loud as I could. I did not have to run very far, before I saw in front of me about five beams of flashlights coming my way. Our loud yells and screams 
had alerted our family as they ran towards me. When I saw the lights were getting closer, I ran faster as the tears streamed down my face. My legs felt so heavy and weak as I tried to reach them as soon as I could. When I heard my dad's familiar voice call out my name, my legs collapsed and I fell on the ground. As they reached me, I was so much in shock that I could hardly tell them what had happened. The only thing I could stutter out was help Tim as I pointed back down the gravel road from where I came. My Uncle Bill, Grandpa, Dad, and all other males in the family began running down the road to where I pointed to go rescue Tim. My mother finally made it to where I was, helped me up, and walked me back to camp. I tried to tell her and my aunties what had happened, but I was still in shock from what I saw, and I was worried sick about Tim. I hoped and prayed that he was not hurt and Uncle Bill would find him soon. When I finally told my story to Mother and the others who gathered around me, I heard Auntie Janet exclaim, Oh my, that sounds like a Bigfoot, as she paced back and forth around the campfire. Janet, don't say that in front of Kevin, Mother barked. Besides, you don't believe in Bigfoot, do you? Auntie Janet turned to my mother as a frightened look washed over her face. Yes, I do, she quietly replied. Tears rolled down my cheeks once again as I realized that Bigfoot was not a made-up creature after all. It was real, and Tim was out in the woods being chased by one. I just could not believe what I had just saw as I impatiently waited for my cousin Tim to come back to camp. I could hardly wait for this nightmare to be over. As we sat, some paced, some sat in their vehicles around the campfire, I noticed how eerily quiet the woods were. I could not hear any nocturnal insects, frogs, or any animals of any kind. All I heard was the crackling of the fire we kept lit. It seemed that the fire was our only protection, and to keep us from losing our sanity, we waited for the men to bring back Tim. I began to calm my nerves as I stared at the blazing campfire. My body stopped shaking, and I leaned back in the chair to try to relax. I slumped down in the chair and laid my head on the backrest and closed my eyes. Immediately, the nightmare I had before flooded my mind. It was so vivid. I remembered some creature chased me, and I could not run fast enough. I remembered in the dream that I was on a path in the woods trying to get away. But what I remembered most was the creature that chased me in the nightmare resembled the same thing Tim and I saw standing in front of us on the gravel road, and soon had chased Tim in the woods. My body began to tremble as panic set in again. I raised my head up to fight the chill I had when Mother wrapped a heavy blanket around my shoulders. I tried to stand up to see if I could see Uncle Bill and the others were bringing Tim back, but I was so weak and every muscle in my body ached. My breathing was labored as I tried to calm my nerves when suddenly I heard Auntie Janet yell out, Here they come, I see their flashlight. Stiff muscles and all, I jumped up and ran to them. As I came closer, I realized Tim's father was carrying him in his arms and it seemed he was not moving. My heart pounded in my chest as I approached them and noticed that Tim was breathing. He also had bloody scratches all over his arms and face. His clothes were stained with dirt and one of his shoes was missing. His father rushed past me and put Tim in the back seat of his car. Without saying a word, he jumped into the driver's seat, started the car, and drove out of the campground. I watched as the taillights faded into the distance before I turned to my Uncle Bill for answers. Pack up, we're leaving tonight, he said, as he rushed to his truck to retrieve his boat and dismantle their campsite. My parents were busily throwing everything we had at our campsite into the car. I quickly fell in place and helped my mother load up all the totes once again into the car while my little sister clung onto mother like her life depended on it. Then I helped dad tear down the tent we had carefully erected earlier that day. I could hear the rest of the family muttering and tearing down their campsites too. 
all the lights were on in the vehicles to have as much light as possible. It was chaos all around, but finally everyone's campsite was cleared and we followed each other out of the campground and soon were on the road back home. The next day, Uncle Bill and I went to visit Tim in the hospital. As we walked into the room, my Uncle Tom and Aunt Verdi sat next to the bed. Uncle Tom told us that he would make a full recovery. He was in a state of shock. The scratches were from all the sticks and briars that he had ran into while he ran into the thick woods. I was so relieved to hear that my best friend and cousin would be all right. While Tim slept, Uncle Bill and I quietly slipped out of the room and he took me to my favorite ice cream parlor. For years, no one had spoken a word about that night. Tim made a full recovery, but would never mention what had happened to him in the woods. I tried to bring up the subject once or twice, but he never wanted to talk about it. So I gave up asking and just had to live without knowing the whole story. Until the day came when he suddenly wanted to tell me what had happened. We were in our late 20s when Tim decided it was time to share his story. Remember, this incident happened when we were both 14 years old. Throughout the years, Tim and I stayed close to each other. We both finished school, had great jobs, and had gotten married and had kids. My son at the time was two years old, and so was his son. We wanted our sons to grow up just like we did, best friends and family. One night, Tim, his wife, and son came over for dinner. While his wife and mine gossiped in the kitchen, Tim and I went to the den to watch the children play. That is when he decided to tell me the story that I wanted to know for so many years. I had an overwhelming feeling of being watched. That is what spooked me first. Then, I noticed the woods being unusually quiet. That put me on edge. I was ready to run back to camp when I remembered the flashlight my dad gave me before we left. I wanted to keep it on for the rest of the way back to camp, but was afraid that there was a bear or something in the woods. The light would attract it. But when we turned the corner and there was this huge creature in the middle of the road, I froze. I didn't know what to do. All I thought about was maybe... If I did shine the light in its eyes, it may have scared it, and it would run away. Boy, was I wrong. When I saw the yellow eyes, my fight-or-flight sensors came on, and I took flight. I panicked and took off running, thinking I could go around him in the woods. That was stupid. I remember just running as fast as I could in my panic state when I realized I was on a narrow path leading to I don't know where. I thought it would lead back to camp, but it led me deeper into the woods. I kept running, and as I looked behind me, I saw the creature closing in on me. Panic set in again, and I tried to run faster, but I knew I couldn't outrun this massive thing. Then I tripped over something and face-planted down in the dirt. As soon as I rolled over, a bright light shone in my eyes, and an arm reached out to grab me. I began to fight off whatever was trying to attack me, but as I struggled, I heard my dad's voice as he tried to calm me. I knew then I would survive. I must have hit my head hard enough to black out for a little while. My dad took my arm, lifted me, and carried me all the way back to camp. I did get a good look at the monster that chased me, he said, and looked at me knowingly. Bigfoot, they are real. But I do not talk about what happened to me because I still have nightmares about it from time to time. And I don't want people to think I'm crazy. My wife already thinks I am. He finished with a nervous chuckle. Finally, he told me the story of what had happened. But then it hit me. My dream the night before, the camping trip. It was almost exactly what he had told me. I still remember that nightmare to this day. So vivid in every detail. Very strange indeed. That is the conclusion of my story, except to tell from that day forward, the family never went camping again, and we were happy to go into the city for our weekend get-togethers. On to the next one. I'm what's called a sound producer 
or a recordant, but most people have no idea what that means. But when I tell them I'm one of those people who go out and record those nature sounds that you use for meditation, white noise, and sleeping, they immediately know what I'm talking about. My recordings run the gamut from the sound of creeks and waterfalls to birdsong, rain, and even things like the calls of coyotes and wolves. In short, if it's something you'd hear in nature, I've recorded it, though I usually stick to ambient sounds, the kind that make you relax. I mention relaxing because I have an accidental recording that has the opposite effect, which I'll get into here soon. I have some very sophisticated recording equipment and make 3D binaural recording. This is a method using two microphones, which makes it sound like you're actually there. If you use headphones and close your eyes, you can really imagine yourself out in nature. I don't really understand it, but people like to hear sounds from places they've been to or would like to visit. To me, if you've heard one babbling creek, you've heard them all. But if that creek is in the Tetons or Yosemite, it's way more popular than if it's in the little brook out in my backyard, even though they all sound similar. It's kind of funny, but I've actually done tests on my friends, saying the first sound is something like Granite Creek or Jenny Lake in Teton National Park and the second is some stream or lake in Idaho, and they'll always prefer the Teton one, even if I play the same sound twice. I guess it just depends on which place they'd rather imagine themselves. The same goes for bird song. I can tell someone that a recording is of sandhill cranes along the Platte River in Nebraska, or sandhill cranes in Utah, and they'll always prefer the one in Nebraska, seeing that's where the birds are most iconic. People ask if I actually make a living doing this, and I have to say yes, I make a good living, and on top of that, I get to be out in places I really enjoy. I've traveled all over the world making recordings. You can buy my recordings on the internet, and I also sell to science and nature museums, educational centers, and even movie producers. As you can guess from what I said above, my most popular stuff comes from the national parks. There's a catch here, though. As any time you're involved in an activity in a national park that can make money, you have to have a permit. And that can get expensive. On top of that, they don't always let you go where you want as they regulate traffic during certain times of the year, especially in the spring when the wildlife has babies. Anyway, I was out recording the sound of elk bugling in the fall in the Tetons, which has big elk refuge. And it occurred to me that I should do albums of the national parks just like photographers do. For example, I could make a sound album of the Tetons that would include the elk bugling, coyotes howling, hidden falls, Cascade Creek, various songbirds, owls at night. Well, you get the picture. So, I got a permit and went to Teton National Park and recorded a bunch of different sounds, with each recording about 10 minutes long then put them all together into an album. It was a big hit. Nature sounds are getting more and more popular as people realize how much they can de-stress you. The album sold to all kinds of people, spa owners, therapists, even psychiatrists. I thought, wow, this is a great way to make a living, going to the national parks and recording nature's music. I felt like I was onto something. It takes time to put an album like this together. You have to decide where to go and what to record. Hopefully, places that people recognize and want to reminisce about 
if they've been there. Then you have to come back to the studio and clean everything up and make a master and then upload it to the various sales platforms. I spent part of a year making park albums for the Tetons and the Grand Canyon. You might wonder what there is to listen to in the Grand Canyon. Since you don't have all the waterfalls and rippling brooks like in the mountains. But I have some cool recordings of the wind sighing through the trees, raptor calls, condor grunts, and snorts, as well as Havasu Falls and some rapids on the Colorado River. Well, I was trying to hit the most popular parks, so I decided that my next album would be Yellowstone. I would record some of the geysers like Old Faithful, then do Yellowstone Falls, some of the creeks, and things like Osprey Calls, Buffalo, Bear, Moose, and Elk Sounds, and maybe even get some wolves howling if I was lucky. I had wrapped up my Grand Canyon album in the fall, the same time they closed the roads into Yellowstone, so I figured I'd have to wait until spring to get started. There was a possibility that maybe I could go into the Lamar Valley in the winter, as that's the only road open. The Lamar Wolf Pack hangs out there, and sometimes even the Molly's Pack, so maybe I could at least record them. I booked a nice little cabin in Gardner, the small town at the north entrance, which was very quiet at that time of year. I would use it as a base while recording everything I could think of in the part of the park that was open, basically Mammoth Hot Springs and the Lamar Valley. I wanted to get as much done as possible before the snows hit, as I'm not much for the winter. Then I would go home for the rest of the year, working on production, and return in the spring. But what happened instead was that I fell in love with Yellowstone and didn't want to leave. I made a few friends there in Gardner as I would go hang out at the headquarters of the Yellowstone Foundation, now called Yellowstone Forever, the nonprofit partner of the National Park. They were very supportive of my project and even wanted to sell my album in their store when I finished it. I loved the little town of Gardner especially in the off-season, and the fact that the Yellowstone River ran right through the middle of it was just icing on the cake, as it allowed me to make some nice recordings from right in front of my cabin. Gardner isn't far from Mammoth Hot Springs, so I also went there and got some great recordings of the hot springs bubbling, as well as the many elk that basically live on the grounds there. But what I really liked was the boiling river there at the north end of the park between Gardner and Mammoth. A nearby sign marked the 45th parallel of latitude, an imaginary line that circles the globe halfway between the equator and the North Pole. The boiling river isn't really a river at all, but a stretch created where the boiling river hot springs mixes with the cold water in the Gardner River. It's like a natural hot tub, a great place to soak up the natural beauty of Yellowstone. Just as an aside, the Gardner River was named for a fur trapper in the 1830s, and the town of Gardner was later also named for him. But they spelled it wrong, so you have the two different spellings. The Gardner River empties into the Yellowstone River near Gardner. Kind of confusing. So, I got to soak in the hot water exactly midway between the equator and the North Pole while doing some recording. It's one of the few places in the park where they allow you to get in the water. I'll never forget sitting there, thinking I have the greatest job in the world. Anyway... I guess I'm a creature of comfort, as I would often go to Boiling Rock and Soak, reveling in the fact that I usually had it all to myself, knowing it was a crowded place in the summer. 
The town of Gardner is much more than a tourist town, for it seems like a lot of the people there are real hardcore Yellowstone lovers, a number of who are retired from park employment. That's where I met the man who would become my husband, Dan. Now, I'm not a kid anymore, and I certainly wasn't looking for a partner having been divorced, but Dan and I hit it off from day one. There was just something about the two of us together. It wasn't particularly romantic, as much as we just had a ton of fun and enjoyed the same thing. We became good friends, then later decided to get married, which is probably the best way to do things. Dan's wife had passed away a number of years ago, so we were both single. Dan was a retired ranger and a walking encyclopedia when it came to the park, and he knew some really interesting stories, things that weren't in the book. I will add that what happened later, right there at Boiling Springs, wasn't entirely a surprise to him. Well, in theory anyway, as he'd heard all about it, even if it was all secondhand to him until then. It seems a number of people who know the park are aware of things going on, but don't want to scare the tourists. Well, Dan and I started hanging out together more and more, and before I knew it, winter had come and my plans to go back home to Las Vegas were pretty much forgotten. I spent a lot of time at Dan's house, a small place on the edge of town with great views of the mountains. Now, even though Dan and I were both in our late 50s when all this happened, we were in great shape, and once the snows hit, we loved to go cross-country skiing. After we were done, we'd go the three miles or so from town to the Boiling River and soak. The park technically closes the river after dark, but there's never anyone there to enforce it in the winter. So, we'd occasionally find ourselves still in the water, watching the sunset, and drinking a glass of wine after a long day of skiing, not getting out until well after dark. It was paradise. Well, until one day anyway, which I'll get to soon. One morning, Dan and I were sitting in his kitchen drinking coffee while he helped me make a list of things to record when I came back next spring. You can do loons, meadowlarks, bison and rut, frogs, ravens, mud pots, magpies, puffin stuff, geysers, and dragon's mouth spring, he said, getting excited. Dragon's mouth spring sounds cool, I replied. It's a steam vent that makes weird sounds. And there's black sand pool, where the ground shakes from the low-frequency thumps made by bubbles deep down in the spring. He paused, thinking, then added, But I have an idea. Why not add something different and do some night sounds? In the summer, there's lots of insects and birds that come out at night. And winter's a good time to record coyote and wolf howls as they hang around the valley looking for lunch since that were all the buffalo and elk stayed. I thought it was a great idea. We could go out to the Lamar Valley at night and maybe record wolves and coyotes singing. We decided to go the very next day, as the weather was good. We'd pack a picnic and head out in the late afternoon, since it was only about a 45-minute drive to the heart of the valley. We'd get there in time to watch the buffalo herds and maybe get some sunset photos. It was a beautiful evening, and even though we never did hear any wolves, I did manage to get a good recording of coyotes yipping. They were actually very close, almost as if they knew what we were doing and wanted to cooperate. It wasn't that late when we reached Mammoth, so we decided to stop and soak in the boiling river. We each carried a good flashlight, so the half-mile walk from the parking area by the highway was easy to find, though I admit it was a bit spooky getting into the river as you couldn't see anything but steam. We sat there, very quietly, listening to the gurgling of the water, kind of half-spooked, though Dan said he felt fine. 
maybe it was my intuition, but I didn't feel fine, and I told him I didn't want to stay long. He seemed disappointed, wanting to soak longer, but after about 15 minutes, we got out. On the way back, we talked about how I'd felt, and we both pretty much chalked it up to me not liking being in the river in the dark, even though it wasn't at all deep that time of year. Well, Dan told me he'd been going to the Boiling River for years, both alone and with friends, though he would never go alone at night. I asked if he ever felt weirded out, and he said only one time, when he heard something in the brush nearby. He was with a friend, and they'd hightailed it out of there. Even though it was winter, they thought it was a bear. I didn't know this, but he said sometimes bears will wake up in the winter and leave the den for a while, then go back in and hibernate. Well, I was determined to get some good recordings of wolf howls. So the next day, we went back to the Lamar Valley. There's a whole network of people in Gardner who are wolf watchers. Some of these people are professional wildlife photographers. The park used to give out the locations of the wolves by tracking their radio collar signals, but they don't provide that information anymore as it was getting to be too invasive for the wolves with people trying to follow them. Dan knew everyone in Gardner, of course, and once they found out what we were doing, his friends would call him any time the wolves were sighted near the highway. We got to where we went to the Lamar Valley at least twice a week, sometimes daily. And in spite of my earlier trepidations, we would almost always stop at the Boiling River on our way back, usually in the dark. It was just so relaxing, physically at least, though I will admit I was still on edge mentally, though I did start to mellow out some. But I did start bringing a can of bear spray with my swimsuit and towel, though I didn't tell Dan. Yellowstone has an incredible history, all the way back to the Native Americans and the early explorers and trappers. It also has an incredible geological story, but what's really interesting and not often told are the more mysterious tales of the park. Dan knew all of them, from the archaeology to the stories of spooks haunting Old Faithful Inn, for some reason, and I didn't really think about it until much later. He started telling me odd stories every time we went to Boiling River. I don't think he was trying to scare me. I think it was just that the setting was so appropriate with the swirling mist and mysterious sounds of the water. Most of his tales were pretty unbelievable, like the story of the gold prospector in the 1870s who had their horses stolen by Native Americans. Supposedly, the natives got swept over the lower Yellowstone Falls with stolen horses. Sometimes, people supposedly hear chanting there and the water turns red. Dan loved geology, so he would talk about things like the underwater geysers in Yellowstone Lake. And since much of the park is an active volcano caldera, there are lots of interesting things everywhere. But he always came back to this one thing that truly puzzled him. He and other rangers had heard strange calls and sounds that nobody could identify, sounds that always left the listener shivering in their boots. And of the strangest things Dan would talk about, this was the one that always gave me the creeps and would make me want to leave the Boiling River. Of course, he was talking about Bigfoot, but he would never call it that, as he felt it lessened it and made it seem like a silly myth, something with big feet and a big ugly face. He would always call them hominid-like creatures, one with enough intelligence to avoid humans. He had a theory, and apparently it was shared by some of his fellow rangers, that this was a real animal that had long ago found the park as a refuge from human encroachment. Given that most of the park is never visited by humans, it would indeed be a good place to hide out. 
when I would ask him if he'd ever seen one, he'd say no, but he'd seen enough evidence of them in the form of footprints and had heard them many times when he was in the back country. It would always give me the chills, ironically, sitting there in the hot water. But when I would ask if they were dangerous, he would say he didn't think so, though I got the feeling he wasn't entirely convinced. Well, it was now mid-January, and the park was locked in deep ice and snow. I'd finally been able to make some really good recordings of wolves howling, and I felt it was time for me to go home to my studio, as well as to get away from the cold. I hated to leave, but I was anxious to get this part of my Yellowstone album done, so I could come back in the spring. So Dan and I decided to spend my last evening there, at our favorite spot in the Boiling River. We took a nice bottle of wine and our swim stuff, and we were soon parked there by the highway, ready for the half-mile hike to the river. Since it was dark and there was no one around, I decided to set up my recorder and microphones on the hood of the car. Maybe I could catch some nice night sounds while we were down at the river. It was a beautiful sunset and I was starting to feel a little poignant, wondering if I really should stay after all. Soon, Dan had started on yet another one of his stories, but this one had a purpose. He was trying to talk me into staying. Katie, if you stay, we can take a snow coach down to Yellowstone Lake and hang out and you can record the Yellowstone hum. I told him I had no idea what he was talking about, and he continued. The first person to get a recording of this will be famous. Lots of people have heard it, even the 1872 Hayden Expedition. It's been the subject of numerous scientific studies, yet it's never been explained. We call it lake music. It's a strange buzzing sound that moves across the lake. I was intrigued, wondering why he'd never mentioned it before. Maybe... I should stay after all. He continued. In 1933, Ranger Watson, caretaker at the Lake Museum, heard the sound nearly every morning for a month. Lots of people have heard it, even a number of geologists, but nobody has ever recorded it. Some people think it's related to the volcanic activity under the lake, or maybe even static electricity. Have you heard it? I asked the mist swirling around us. It was now dark, and I was beginning to feel uneasy, like we should go. I heard it only once in all my years in the park, he replied. It reminded me of the sound of overhead electrical wires, except it started in the distance and moved overhead like a flock of birds, then faded in the opposite direction. It was really strange. Katie, if you could only record it. It's hard to describe, but I felt as if I was right there with Dan, experiencing what he'd felt as he told me about the electricity passing over him, so much so that I could feel the hair on my neck stand up. It took a second for me to realize that I wasn't reacting to his story, but there really was electricity or something around us right there at the Boiling River, not at Yellowstone Lake. Dan was suddenly quiet. I could now see his hair was standing on end as he put his hand on my arm as if to reassure me or even to say something. His touching me gave me a shock. Then he simply tumbled over, completely passed out in the water. I instinctively grabbed his arm and began pulling him up and out onto the riverbank, no easy task, for he was totally limp. I finally had him by the shoulders and pulled him out. I was thankful he wasn't a heavy guy. My first thought was that he'd had a heart attack, as I couldn't feel his pulse. I began CPR, and after a few minutes, was happy to find he had a pulse again. Each time I touched him, I'd get a slight shock, kind of like the static electricity you build up when walking across a carpet, or when taking clothes out from a dryer. 
so far, I'd been cool as a cucumber. But when I saw something standing in the shadows of a small stand of trees just across the river, I panicked. The Gardner River wasn't more than 30 feet across and could be easily crossed at that time of year. Whatever it was, I knew it wasn't there to help and had something to do with Dan passing out. I had to get him to the car, but I couldn't drag him that far, especially over the rocks and uneven path. Even though I was somewhat panicked, I still had the presence of mind to quickly walk over to the rock where my towel and swim bag were, and pull out my bear spray. I then slipped on my shoes, for I knew I was going to have to somehow carry or drag down to the car. But now I was totally panicked. Where were the car keys? Dan's towel and clothes were only a few feet from mine, but whatever was in the trees still stood there, watching, and I was afraid to move. I could see a faint yellow reflection in its eyes, which were a good five feet off the ground. I finally reached over and grabbed Dan's pants from a nearby rock, finding his keys clipped to a belt loop, then picked up his boot and was quickly back by his side. The electricity seemed to be gone, and when I touched him again, I didn't get shocked. I felt his pulse, then heard him moan. Dan, get up, I whispered. We have to get to the car. I slipped his boots onto his feet as I said this, still eyeing whatever was in the trees, which hadn't moved. I pulled him up, and he was able to stand, though wobbly, and we began slowly making our way along the river. I knew that the hike back was going to seem like forever, assuming we even made it. We stumbled along, me half-dragging down, until I heard a loud crashing sound behind us. As I turned to look, I could see a dark form splashing across the river, running hard, headed straight for us. I pulled down to the side of the trail, then pulled the safety off my bear spray canister. It was a moose, a really big bull moose, and as he got closer, I could see sparks flying off his feet as he ran across the rocks, which seemed really odd. Later talking to Dan, we both decided it must have had some kind of electrical charge like Dan did. The moose was soon past us, running as hard as it could, followed by a strange silence and a sense of foreboding. I could now see strange balls of blue electricity rolling down the steep hillside behind the trees. Soon, Something entered the small stand of trees across the river. Something that shimmered an electrical blue and wavered back and forth in the darkness. Dan seemed to be getting his strength back and was now moving faster, knowing we had to get to the car. Something very strange and surreal was going on. I looked back, and now the entire stand of trees was glowing a bluish white. The figure still standing there, now, from across the valley and behind us, there was a sound like someone yelling woo in the distance, a long, prolonged, drawn-out call. Now the figure in the trees started across the river, the water all around it taking on a weird bluish-white cast. We were soon at the car, where I unlocked it and pushed down inside the passenger door, then ran around and jumped in the driver's side, immediately locking the doors. We made it, but to my chagrin, when I turned the key, nothing happened. The engine wouldn't start, and all I heard was the sound of the ignition clicking. I tried again and again, but soon stopped, afraid I would drain the battery. This was my worst nightmare come true. Dan and I, still in our swimsuits and dripping wet, would quickly freeze to death if we couldn't get the car started, and no one would find us until morning. We were both already starting to shiver, but it wasn't a minute later that I could see the apparition coming our way, still surrounded by the glowing bluish aura, now having crossed the river. Dan and I both slouched down into our seats as far as we could. As it approached, 
I could both hear and feel a strange electrical buzzing at the same time. And when I knew it was next to the car, the feeling was so intense it made my skin itch. The car's interior was now so bright, I could see Dan as easily as if a floodlight were pointed at us. He had his head down, but I made the mistake of looking up. There, looking in at us, was the strangest face I've ever seen. Thick and square-jawed, with eyes that drilled right through me. It was so big, it had to crouch over to look inside. And what stood out most was that it had long hair all over its body. Hair that was standing straight on end from what looked like an electrical charge. It seemed to stand there forever, but it was probably only a few seconds. Then it left, the glow subsiding until it was dark again. I was running on autopilot, unable to believe what was happening, but I managed to have enough sense to try again to start the car. Now, amazingly, it started right up. I was about to take off when I realized my recording equipment was still on the hood, so I quickly jumped out and grabbed it. Driving back to Gardner, I was terrified that I would see the thing along the highway. Back at Dan's, we both took long, hot showers to warm up. Then I borrowed a shirt and some sweatpants since my clothes were still on a rock back by the river. I decided to spend the night there, partly because I didn't want to be alone, but also because I wanted to be sure he was okay, even though he said he was feeling fine. It was a long night for me, though Dan seemed to sleep well. I paced the floor, trying to process what I'd seen. The next morning, Dan seemed to be low energy, wanting to rest most of the day. We did get a couple of our friends to take us back to the boiling river to get our clothes, though neither of us really wanted to go. Back at the river, I began to feel nauseated. Dan didn't want to leave me alone, so his two friends went and got our clothes. Both remarked that the place had an odd odor, smelling faintly like singed grass. It was a tough decision, but I finally left Gardner, Dan deciding to go with me. We'd both been unable to sleep, and I kept thinking. I saw something looking in the windows, and my appetite was totally gone. We needed to retreat to the sanity and security of a different place. It was the right thing to do. For once back in Las Vegas, we both started to feel better. I soon made good progress on the Yellowstone Sound album and was starting to look forward to finishing it. We reluctantly returned to Gardner in the spring and finished up the project, making more recordings around Yellowstone Lake and the geysers and places we'd been unable to get to during the winter. But I never felt comfortable, and I always made Dan go out with me. Dan eventually sold his house, and we moved to his hometown of Thermopolis, Wyoming, where his mom and two grown kids lived. We finally got married, and I joined him there. And just like when we were in Gardner, we would often spend our evenings in the hot pools there, though the hot springs in Thermopolis are next to town and feel safe since it's a state park. We weren't all that far from Yellowstone's eastern gate at Cody, and we figured we would go visit the park once in a while, but we never did. It was as if we'd lost interest and felt uncomfortable there. To this day, neither of us has a satisfactory explanation for what happened that night at the Boiling River, but Dan really thinks it had something to do with electromagnetism and the volcanic nature of Yellowstone. I know that sounds really vague, but they say the molten magma in the Yellowstone caldera is only a couple of miles below the surface and molten magma contains iron. I at first thought maybe it had something to do with this, but then I read that molten iron loses its magnetic properties, so now I have no idea. Maybe that particular location at the Boiling River has something going on I just don't understand, but since Dan and I had been there so many times without anything happening, I can't help but think 
it has something to do with the creature itself. It is possible that the car not starting was just a coincidence, but Dan takes immaculate care of his vehicles, and it started right up after the creature left. Did the creature somehow interfere with the car's electrical system? And why did Dan pass out? And why did the moose seem to have sparks at its feet? And what about the balls of lightning coming down the slope and the weird glow in the trees, as well as of the creature itself and its hair standing on end? When I finally got around to checking out my recordings, I was shocked, to say the least. The distant yell before the creature crossed the river came through loud and clear, and after that, you could hear me and Dan's muffled talking as we made it to the car. Then the ignition clicked, and finally, after a few minutes, the sound of static. I figure this was when the creature was looking in our window. As the static slowly fades, a strange electrical-sounding voice can be heard, but then it morphs into a higher voice, saying, order more tacos. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. The static had apparently made my recorder loop back into a recording I'd made when Dan and I were goofing off at a local Mexican restaurant. I was showing him how the recorder worked, and I thought I'd later erased it. I still had the sound of the weird call, but I would give anything to know what that creature had said, assuming I could have understood it. But I guess it will remain a mystery, just like so many other things in Yellowstone. On to the next one. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!